as we lead, and we lead articulately and with great preparation, we still have to be really faithful to make sure our corrections of children are done in a way that respects the child as an individual. That one of the other things I think that does go very far is that I work hard to celebrate our teachers in front of our students. When we feel celebrated, I think we also feel compelled to give our best and to give the class that they are in an, a moment of opportunity to give them a round of applause, for me to describe in front of them the amount of work and preparation that I know their teacher has done. I think that that imparts value to what they then turn to do at home for weeks and weeks uh, without my direct observations in those moments. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show from Memoria Press that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. Jeez. Oh my gosh. I forgot to bring a weapon. Congratulations to the cast and crew of Classical Etc. on accomplishing 100 episode recordings. Big round of applause, guys. <laughs> I literally felt the ceiling was coming down. <laughs> yeah, wow. Gunfire oh. in the studio. <laughs> Are we on still? I don't know. I'm, I'm just shaking to my core. <laughs> All right. Well, um, continuing on. <laughs> I'm never doing this again. For, for our 100th episode, we brought on Mandy Gross to terrify her <laughs> and Martin and Paul. So Mandy, you're the director of the cottage school. That's right. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. You know my ran my favorite random piece of trivia about And I hope this is right. Okay. <laughs> random, my favorite random piece of trivia, aside from being here for our 100th episode, is you walked onto U L's basketball team? Oh, goodness, no. Oh. I don't know who misinformed you. No, oh, I attempted to walk on to the University of Florida's basketball team. Okay, and it's still pretty. pretty it's, I mean, it you shows. attempted meaning you you just walked out on the court during a game. <laughs> <Did you know? laughs> no, I had uh, some history of, of basketball in high school, and then had some offers from smaller schools. Hmm. Decided to go to a humongous school and tried out uh -huh. as a walk on, um, but choked during my tryout, uh -oh. which has been a good character building experience. Sure. Um, and we just wanted to further that by bringing this up on a, on yeah. a podcast. Um, Manny, good, Sorry to wrap up. You can't Alderson. win them all. Honestly, yeah. this is true. trying to walk onto a Division One basketball team is an impressive thing in and of itself. <laughs> I mean, you know, unless you were completely delusional, that means you're good. decently good at basketball. Well, I think maybe, yes, that is <laughs> true. You know, knowing Isaiah and uh, your son <laughs> and seeing him dunk on people who work in Warrior <laughs> Press, you know, I believe it. So, well, I'd certainly dunk on you more. <laughs> It, he, he hasn't tried it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so today's episode, I, I still am just shaking to my core by the confetti <laughs> on the table, and but we need to move forward. So the episode is going to be about building culture and community. And there, we're brought on Mandy, aside from just being a very articulate and great person to have on, you have been a big part of helping to build the culture of the one day program here at Highland Science School over the last few years. But before we get to that topic, Martin, I have to ask you, in honor of our hundredth episode, what are you reading? What are you reading? Recently? I, I, you know what? You, you, every time you ask that question, I'm sitting in. here thinking. He asks this question every show, and I never think before coming on about what it is because I mean, you know, you know, I'm reading a bunch of different things. I, I, but what I'm most involved in right now is Ian Toll's. Uh, I think it's called The War in the Pacific. It's the, mm -hmm. he's got a three volume series of the war against Japan in, in the Pacific. And it's just a fascinating study. Um, the friendship between Churchill um, and Roosevelt. Uh, the, the terrible state in, uh, that our preparedness was in before that war. How the Japanese, I didn't know that the Japanese had better equipment than we did. Mm -hmm. Better equipment than we did. And lots more of it. Which is why we just got shellacked at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. And um, so I... I um, I, I, you know, of course you think about America and China today and whether we're adequately prepared if something were to ever happen and those kind of worry you, but, but it's just a, a fascinating study in these great, um, military leaders, uh, Admiral Halsey and, um, and, um, 
George MacArthur, who who had a mixed reputation among his colleagues, <laughs> and um, and this sort of thing. So it's just, uh, uh, of course, uh, wars bring out the best and the worst in people. So it's always an interesting character study. And when you're in the hands of a great biographer, you a uh, great uh, writer, you um, you enjoy it. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it is. Mandy, what about you? What have you been reading recently? Yes, I just finished a biography of Kenneth Graham, and I adore Wind in the Willows, mm. and so felt compelled to read about him and learn about him. And his life was certainly harder and, and full of more grief than I would have imagined. And so it's been interesting to reframe my understanding of his work from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of time period was Kenneth Graham? So, oh gracious, I didn't know I was going to get a test. Um, <laughs> well, the early 20th century. Yes, early 20th century. Okay. Yep. Yep. Was there anything particularly about his life that you found compelling? Mm, mm. Well, his son was very troubled, which mm. I think is a big theme that we teach through the curriculum to our students. And because I think his work was really intended to bless his child. And so um, just like any of us that are involved in education, we really invest in those that we are nearest and dearest to. And so um, I felt that it was interesting to consider what he was really trying to get across to his son. Um, also the, the troubled nature of his marriage and just um, those things. It was, I think it was helpful to see that though his life was full of some of those tr challenges that he really um, used his gifts beautifully. Yeah. But what about you? Well, I finished the grapes of wrath. Oh, uh, what did you think about that final scene? Did not see that coming. Yeah. Did not see that coming. And I actually had to back up. I think I was, the irony of this was I was list, I was finishing it while I was on the tractor. Right. And the whole thing is the tractors came in and uprooted these people from their lives. I'm like, oh, I feel bad now about this, but I'm sitting there on the tractor <laughs> listening to it. And I get, that scene, that very last scene. And I was like, Oh, wait a second. And I just, I had to back it up. Yeah. I rarely, you have your rewind, re rewind rule. I, I don't have that rule. Um, what is your re rewind? If I'm not, if I find that I've lost focus on an audiobook, always rewind. Oh yeah. See, I, 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 I learned to listen by, by people reading during a meal like in a monastic fashion. So you couldn't rewind. Like if you missed it, you missed it. So I'm used to kind of filling in those gaps and just kind of keep going. But when I hit that scene, I just had to back it up and go, what did I just listen to? Um, because it's just, I mean, you just realize they're at the very, very edge of survival. Yeah. And, and so that one, that one, I, I was glad I, I, I had to, I felt like I had to power through that one in a way. I didn't have to power through East of Eden. East of Eden kept my attention much more oh, really? than the Grapes of Wrath. So in, in the end, would you say you liked East of Eden better than Grapes of Wrath? Yes. Suss that out for me. Um, I feel like East of Eden... No, I no, I picked up that phrasing from Tanya. I don't feel like anything. I think <laughs> that, the, the, that East of Eden deals with a larger, greater idea of evil itself. Um, whereas grapes of wrath is, is more of a, of a, of a, like a particular working out of str the struggles of being human and ownership and, and, uh, family, uh, legal structures that are, are against, uh, the human, those sorts of things where, so I just felt like East Vaden was, was on a, on a more cosmic scale. Oh, a greater theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking how great it would be to be able to rewind your life. Mm -hmm. you, you do something. You find that you you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And you, and you rewind <laughs> yeah. about four days. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one last question about uh, Graves of Wrath. Did you, I feel like you would identify with, I, I feel as though you would identify with the preacher character. Not everything about him, but like, or do you? Casey. Tell, tell me more I about did, this. I did love Casey. Yeah. Uh, except for what like drives him out of ministry. Yeah, yeah but, sure, okay. Um, Not that part. But Casey is struggling between being somebody who is preaching the faith, I think, to somebody who's who's living it. I think is, I mean, that's maybe not a totally fair characteristic, no, but yeah, I think, I think a, so. generally uh, right, where he ends up, mm, can I give a spoiler? Spoiler? Yeah. Okay. Sure. If you have, you, you've he, had a hundred years. Yeah. Okay. 
he ends up giving up his it's, life. It's a fast forward moment for some people. Yeah. Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he ends up giving up his life for, um, for people that are actively undermining his project of trying to get fair wages for those people. Right. So like he's giving up his life and that, so for something that's going to benefit the strike breakers. And I mean, it's, that's kind of self-sacrifice. I mean, it's one of the most Christian things to do, but he, like he's, he says throughout the book, like I, I, I know I, he struggles to pray anymore, but he's, but he, but in what he's living, he's, he's giving, he's loving the people around him and the way that he's been loved. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it's a very, he's a fascinating character. Yeah. But I, I, but honestly, as I went through it, like I liked, I liked Casey, but I, I was, I like the whole, the whole struggle of the, of the family and how they're sticking together and, and, but their desire to live off of the land that I, I identified with all of that. Sure. It's, it's, but I just, I felt so, so bad for them because they just, there was no way for them to even build up any sort of, any sort of wealth, anything that would give them stability. They couldn't find stability. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Many of you read that? I have. It's been since high school though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is my first time through it. So it was a, I, I, I would have struggled with it in high school. I'm mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Moving to the topic at hand, Mandy, when we, when I mo- came to Memorial Press five years ago, the cottage school was, I think, roughly 60, 70 students. Mm-hmm. Now it's 400. Mm-hmm. And with that comes the challenges of building a community and a culture. Mm-hmm. Talk about what you have seen as the greatest challenges to building a culture for this mm-hmm. school that only meets one day a week. Mm-hmm. You know, the, for the high schoolers, it's two days. What have you had to focus on? What have been the things that have gotten in the way of helping to build the culture in the way that you have? Mm-hmm. Well, I feel that we've been really privileged to be uh, part of the Highlands umbrella because I think that's probably been a circumstance that's avoided many of the struggles we would have had otherwise if we were independent fully from the full-time school. But um, I think some of the challenges have been um, making sure families understand, making sure the community understands the viability of what we do the sustainability of what we do, and also just inspiring parents to have the staying power it takes to really educate these children, to give them a rigorous education. You know, our, I, I think our culture struggles with um, when our, ch- our children are unhappy. And so there are moments of unhappiness that we welcome when we welcome rigor. And so um, that's probably been the hardest thing is to keep spurring our people on to love and good deeds within that framework. Martin, you were here when HLS was getting off the ground initially, kind of as a cottage school. And do you see those challenges that Mandy is talking about mirrored in the original founding as well? Well, we did it a little differently, actually, because we did, we started in the middle grades and worked out. I think we, I can't remember how I was involved in the founding of the cottage school too, mm-hmm. but I can't mm-hmm. remember what grades we started. With. No, actually, I think fairly mm-hmm. identically, we had no primary school and no high school. That's right. And I remember. So we did in build form. in both okay. directions. All right. So I guess. All right. So, well, it was just it, the um, it, it was starting out. It was it was it was a, and I think it was an even bigger project then, in terms of educating people on a limited schedule school like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, this this was. A much newer idea back then than than it is now. I think people now are much more willing to look at alternative ways of doing education. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly partly because of COVID, but really mm-hmm. even before that, you know, homeschooling was uh, growing pretty mm-hmm. dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but I, you know, we just found that um, that parents. Uh, particularly in some of those middle grades, need help. It, it's much easier to teach in the lower grades than it is in the, in the uh, middle and upper schools. And, um, and so that was really our, 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 the, the, that core, that, that's why you can start there, mm-hmm. because that's when people start feeling very inadequate. Mm-hmm. But then they realize, oh, well, this might work for my younger kids too, because it is, 
it is just one day a week. You've got a, cur- a set curriculum. You've got help that outside of your home that, that one day a week. It's just a, it's a great aid to homeschoolers, I think. Shane, I want to go back to something that Mandy said uh, at the beginning was that probably being under the full-time Highlands umbrella kind of saved her from some things. But um, I remember when my sisters and I were taking classes from Cheryl Lowe and her trying to, when, when she was trying to get the, uh, the habit of taking the national Latin exam started Mm -hmm. and, you know, I was too young to take it, but my older sister was and, and the, the, um, you know, Cheryl was trying to convince all of the parents that this is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And now that's just not even a question, Mm -hmm. right? This is just what we do. Um, and so I could see a school that is completely independent struggling with that sort of thing Mm -hmm. because you got to do all that kind of, um, convincing Mm -hmm. because it's not just, this is what we do because this is identifies with our vision, but you really have to have much longer conversations explaining Mm -hmm. why this is important. Mm -hmm. Well, and, uh, a little, little lesson in, um, in not getting discouraged, uh, when, when we had the very first meeting. Uh, to to have every to have parents show up when we present what we were doing, uh, all this stuff, and Martin, this is for the cottage school, for the cottage to, school. to launch the cottage mm-hmm. school after the full time school that was established. Yes. Okay, and so we um, we set everything up. We had we had twenty five chairs in there, being hopeful, and it, it was at two o'clock, and so we sat there and we waited and we set up and everything. And the clock got close twenty minutes till two. Nobody had shown up. Mm-hmm. Fifteen minutes, ten minutes. Still, nobody has sh- had shown up. At about two till, these two parents came in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had two people there when, when at the, when at the start time. By <laughs> by two thirty, we had eighty five people <laughs> there, and we had to get out extra chairs. <laughs> so that sounds right. Um, yeah. Sometimes it takes a little while for uh, interest to build mm-hmm. <laughs> and people to get there. Mm-hmm. And and when you're starting anything, any project like this, particularly an education project, which requires students, um, it, it can take some time to build that, but mm. they will show up mm. uh, ultimately if you've got something that's worthwhile, people think it's mm-hmm. worthwhile. So when, when you're pursuing this kind of worthwhile thing, it seems like, Mandy, you probably have had to develop language about what you're doing because mm-hmm. of the amount of conversations you're having. The reason I'm asking these questions is I'm imagining a parent or the people that I'm talking to who are trying to create these kinds of communities, mm-hmm. and they're probably not thinking about culture, even though it's so important. Mm-hmm. What is the What are the ways that you've developed language, and what are the things that you have found yourself talking about mm-hmm. over and over again as you've tried to help build this culture? Mm-hmm. Well, I come back to our hopes for the heart of the parents involved, the heart being um, one that in reverence acknowledges their need for God and therefore is going to communicate that in their home to their children. I think that that is a great place for us to start, that all of our faith journeys may look unique, but that um, that that part of what we do is essential because it, it really helps us to lead the children well, to to not only feel mom and dad's partnership with us, but to lead them in terms of virtue and character. Um, some of the other things we, we really talk about a lot um, are just the the joys that come with seeing our children have success and victory and struggling through um, the good work that we have for them. I do think that we often are now seeing families come to us that have have some amount of fatigue from what feels like a lack of education elsewhere. And they really are just so delighted to find a safe and clear direction for what we do. Um, and, and we try to help at the cottage school families understand this is a partnership. And so that really means that each family is going to execute things differently at home some of our families are checking every box and going deep with their children and pre-reading those books and um, pushing their children differently toward excellence. And others have a softer approach, have a different approach. So we try to also really talk about um, a parent's unique uh, freedom to customize what we do here at the cottage school. So that's some of it. Yeah. I think also um, just helping parents understand that 
we are here to both hold the child accountable, but also to bring our excellence in the classroom. And for many of our families that struggle with confidence in a subject area, that is just a, a joy for them to hear that their child will be both encouraged, given excellent education, um, but also held accountable in ways that it's really hard to do for some of our families at home. Yeah. One of the things you said there was that you know, a lot of times parents are coming to you now mm-hmm. with a dissatisfaction with where they're coming from. So Martin Paul, how have you guys counseled educators on this tension that seems to be between when you're starting something new, you want everybody to be there? and you want to bring in as many students as you can because you want to build it. But then also this other piece that sometimes people are running from something don't tend to be the mm-hmm. best people to keep within your, in your gates. How do you guys think about that tension? I've, I've, um, there's a couple of examples that come to mind where maybe in like their first year or second year, I have said, look, if you need this family to be able to pay your teachers, then I might go ahead with it. But if not, because your culture is so important and you can clearly tell they're running from and not to, then it would, it would do you better in the long term to help build your culture, to tell that family, we're, we're not going to be a great fit for you. Um, sometimes it's hard, it's hard to tell because they're, they're all, their whole focus is only what's behind them. And they haven't had a time to think about what they want. And, and so it's just, it, you have to, you really have to probe that. And that's, Mandy, do you do family interviews? So we have, our admissions process is really unique. So we try to get to know families during our open house tours. And then with high school students, we do require an admissions interview. Those high school students tend to have a pretty heavy footprint around here in terms Mm -hmm. of what character they bring and what they do to the culture. I think um, to this point, we have not required an individual admissions interview for K through seven, uh, well, K through eight. Um, So we've, we really, really try to lean on sober language during open Mm -hmm. houses, really being clear with our families about uh, making sure they understand course selection and uh, adherence to our policies is is really something that's on the shoulders of the parent. So we've also incre- increased our orientations with families. And even after some of those new parent orientations, we do have folks that realize some things, make mm. adjustments to course selections, or sometimes rarely, but still might back away from the community, mm. understanding that the expectations are really clear. I think that's yeah. very good medicine for some of those problems. Yeah, and I, of course, it's the older the child, the harder that process is because if you've got a child who's been in a five day a week school and then they're coming in <laughs> in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade, that's that's going to be a big adjustment for them. They're not used to doing as many things on their own, and for the parents, uh, and and for the parents, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and but ironically, they're going to have to do that when they graduate high school and go off to college. So. Um, <laughs> But that, that is a conversation we have in the online academy a lot too. If folks coming from a full-time school into the online academy, mm-hmm. like it's almost even more for us that we have to be worried about. Mm-hmm. Is the parent really ready to to be in partnership with us? Mm-hmm. Or are they used yeah. to just farming so, that so, out? Yeah, so, so there are things the parent doesn't know how to do either because those things have been being done for them. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a big adjustment for a mm-hmm. lot of people. Uh, much easier to make if you've, uh, you're starting your kids very young and they get used to that or, mm-hmm. or they're, they're coming from a successful home school mm-hmm. uh, environment. And, and they just need some support. Yeah. Yes, there are, I find more and more families in the last few years that desire rigor after a certain point of those lovely grammar stage years, mm-hmm. those lovely primary years, mm-hmm. then they think, well, now we're ready for something sure. hard and good. <laughs> and often those are the kids that really have a hard time mm-hmm. because they haven't been given good foundation for mm-hmm. how to fight through. So mm-hmm. purely out of curiosity, I know it's Shane's yeah. role to ask questions, but purely, purely out of curiosity. Um, are you still having, are you, are you having people like this year? Do you have people come to join the cottage school that started homeschooling during COVID and are just now saying, I need some support? A few, a handful. Huh. Yes. But less than in the last couple of years. Couple yeah. years yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of the factors that help 
in making that adjustment. Because mm-hmm. um, I think one of the ways in which our program is different from others is the richness of the literature. Mm-hmm. And I know, and I'm speaking as the grandfather of, of uh, one of your students for about three years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really the literature that mm-hmm. was the most exciting thing for mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. So I've, I, I wonder, I wonder just psychologically what it's like for a child to go from, from a regular school. And if it, particularly if it's a, public school or something where the, where the, the literature is very weak. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not very good a lot of times. And then they come into a, a mm-hmm. curriculum where <clears throat> that's number one, very important. Mm-hmm. And number two, where the books they're reading are so good. Mm-hmm. Does that make a noticeable difference for them? I kind of wonder that. I don't mm-hmm. know if you have any answers for that. I think it certainly does. I, I really do. I think that what we're asking in the public schools is for children to to dip their toe in a series of cold puddles mm-hmm. and here the literature is warm and they bask in it. Yeah. And so I think and you we spend see time that. In it yes, we time. see and that's one thing we we really plead with our teachers, bring your joy. Mm-hmm. Get excited about Farmer Boy in front of them as you read it with mm-hmm. them. You know, make sure because they bring that enthusiasm home. They really mm-hmm. do. And I think all the way up through senior year my teacher observations, I most delight in stepping into those literature mm-hmm. windows because the children and the teachers are are both just so delighted. And I think Farmer Boy is a good bo- good book to read before lunch because he eats his way <laughs> through the whole world. This is true. <laughs> it's insightful. This is true. No, yeah. can, can, I, can, we, can we just bask in this? What a great Mandy metaphor. Used, used yeah. the word bask, but this metaphor of <laughs> series of cold puddles <laughs> versus like warm. That, that, that was perfect. great. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you, Martin, your grandson's name is Soren, right? He is. How often do you put a call into the principal of the cottage school to like get your way with, you know, when Soren comes home and he's complaining <laughs> about something? Well, I'm not there uh, because I'm just a grandparent. But uh, yeah, it would, you, you know, if when I, I've learned this over the years with uh, teaching and parenting is that if the, if the child is complaining and the teacher is is not agreeing with with the the basis for the complaint. The teacher is always right, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't have much of a problem. Well, that. well that's good. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about the students in, and the family's role in building culture. What about teachers, Mandy? What has been your message mm-hmm. to teachers, especially? Mm-hmm. I'm thinking here. You're this is a one day program, mm-hmm. and of course we have the full day full program. But as mm-hmm. your student body has grown, mm-hmm. you've had to grab more and more teachers that are teaching one day a week. Mm-hmm. How do you ensure that you have this high level of excellence and mm-hmm. the kind of character that you're asking for? And you you started out your mm-hmm. appeal to families as we all need God in our lives. How do you mm-hmm. ensure that each of your teachers have that priority? Mm. Well, I, I think I lean heavily on the Holy Spirit to discern in interviews, you know, that that's going to go really well. Uh, I'm clear with our teachers that one of our main priorities is that we are void of shame in the classroom. I feel that as we lead and we lead articulately and with great preparation, we still have to be really faithful to make sure our corrections of children are done in a way that respects the child as an individual. Um, we still welcome that input from our teachers. Um, but our teachers, that one of the other things I think that does go very far is that I work hard to celebrate our teachers in front of our students. And so when we feel celebrated, I think we also feel compelled to give our best. And so we try really hard um, at least once in the first half of the year, once in the second half, to bring in a treat for each teacher uh, throughout the week and to give the class that they are in an, a moment of opportunity to give them a round of applause for me to describe in front of them the amount of work and preparation that I know their teacher has done. I think that that imparts value to what they then turn to do at home for weeks and weeks uh, without my direct observations in those moments. So that's those college school students are generous. I actually still have a 3D printed bust of Julius Caesar on my desk <laughs> from a cottage school student. That's pretty cool. They do learn to love their teachers, yeah. but oh. teachers do. Uh, they need that. I, we have a weekly email that goes out. We try to go meeting light, but encouragement heavy. And mm. I think that's really It seems helpful. meeting light is very important in this one day mm-hmm. model. Paul, what other thoughts do you have about creating culture and especially encouraging or mobilizing your teachers to do it? Um, 
Well, everything, everything goes into culture, right? I mean, the culture is just how we, the habits of how we live. And so the one that I, I was thinking about in the college school that I wish I could implement in the online school is a uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I, I mean, I watched the college school when we had a dress code and then when we implemented a uniform and it, it's night and day difference, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and so just, it, that was one thing that I had to make very clear when I, um, started working in the online academy was that I was going to require a professional dress code on my teachers, mm-hmm. you know, that that was going to be explicit that you were, they were going to be held to that. Um, because even though I can't necessarily hold the kids to that in the online, in an online program, the, 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 who they're seeing, the teacher they're seeing ought to be dressed professionally Mm -hmm. because that's going to, um, affect the, the attitude towards the work. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's how we dress is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. The attitude is affected also just the, the manner of preparation, Mm -hmm. knowing I need not only to have my uniform, but I need it to be clean. There are ripple effects from that within how they work as students. Right, they have to start thinking, yeah. uh, you know, the day before, not only do I have my homework done, but are my clothes ready, yeah. right? Like everything has to be ready. Mm-hmm. So Martin, now you're trying to create a culture with the Memorial College most intimately these days. And your teachers are characters like Bean Groyan and Tracy Lee Simmons. How has this gone for you? How influential are you as a leader of men amongst these, these gentlemen? Well, um, they usually dress more nicely than I do, so that that helps. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, when you have you have some of those kinds of people who really they're they have a whole career, you know, not whole career, but they have a good part of a career behind them already. They know what they're doing. They're manifestly uh, knowledgeable in what they're teaching, um, and they're with us because, you know, we're not their main job. Usually a lot of the, my professors, because we're, we have an online program, we have the, um, uh, we have the benefit of, of being able to get professors who don't have to quit their day jobs at whatever the university they're at. Um, and they're doing it because a lot of my professors are doing it not because they need the money because, you know, our pay isn't that high. Um, they're doing it because they love it. They love the subject. They love sharing their subject. They're and 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 some of my professors who are still teaching in universities now, uh, Vegan and Tracy are not no longer doing that. But um, some of my professors who are teaching in regular universities, it's like they're so glad to to not have to be teaching board freshmen. Mm-hmm. Um, these are adults who are excited about because none of them have to be there either. Really, mm-hmm. they're taking the program because they enjoy it. So. That's a little bit of a different environment, I think, when uh, than than uh, than what we're talking about here. But although I think that, as I've observed, hybrid schools around the country, a lot of times the best schools are the ones that have a heavier amount of people like that who want to teach just to teach, and they just have a day a week mm-hmm. that they're at the cottage school, and it's such rich material. Right. There's so many priorities that we place on students and on faculty in modern higher education that have very little to do with actual learning um, and and the actual content of what they're teaching. Um, but if you can get an environment where the text is the central thing and uh, you know, nobody's having to worry about, you know, uh, uh, writing their dissertation on some um, some narrow, uninteresting topic to get ahead in that professional world and your students are there, not because they have to have a master's degree necessarily for anything. Um, they're just there for the love of learning. And, and that's, uh, that's everything. Mm-hmm. So Mandy, a lot of the people I hear from who listen to this, um, this show sometimes will be people who are trying to start schools. Mm-hmm. If you were advising someone knowing what you know now, after Mm -hmm. having kind of just worked on this and continuing to build and build here, Mm -hmm. what do you think are the top one or two things you would say to someone at the outset that you wish that you had known at the outset to help them establish the best possible culture that you can for the school? Mm -hmm. I think one of the main reasons we experience such growth and such steady um, retention of students, which would be ultimately what you're talking about here is that, Everyone, I hope everyone that comes through our doors really feels and understands our care 
about their families. That personal touch has been really important. We are extremely responsive. We try to get back to our families from the office um, as quickly as we can so that their their stories are told, their their questions are answered. I think that's one of the keys. We don't I think that a lot of customer service has started to die in different um, markets. And so we really try to do a very good job with that. Um, so that's been important. I think. So you th- haven't outsourced your customer service to AI <laughs> yeah. like everybody else? We have not. Oh, no. Thank is you. that a thing? Oh, well, gosh, and, it's I terrible. Mean, and think about it. I mean, you, you have their kids in your care. <laughs> yes. Right? Like if, if there's one thing they're going to be concerned about is that they can reach you when yes. they need you. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that we care and we want Mm -hmm. to give them the answers that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, If families are interested in having meetings with me to talk about what's coming up next year and, uh, you know, what curriculum is going to be best for my child, I I try to make sure that there's there's time for that within my day. So that's one thing. I think um, another thing is just making sure they understand that we're going to go to great lengths to make sure their children are getting the best from their teachers. And that, I mean, honestly, Memoria Press is such a gift, and we really believe in that. I think our administration really believes in what we're doing and why we do it. And so it's an easy thing. It's, I think we, we attract a lot of families just because there's goodness in what we do. So, yeah, and that's certainly beyond, I didn't write every workbook. I certainly did not, but it's a blessing. Paul, any thoughts of advice for someone setting out on this adventure specifically towards culture? Uh, I would say, uh, number one, patience. Um, and number two, um, realistic expectations. You know, I mean, I, um, recently got an email from a principal who's, this is her first year being a principal. And she's like, I'm, I feel like I'm putting out fires all the time, like heading off kids doing this thing and this other thing. And, you know, correcting people with pink hair and you know, whatever, you know, all these sorts of things. And she's like, is this just what it's like? And I was like, yes, yes, it is. And this is, you know, but you know, I always try to encourage administrators saying like what we're, what we're trying to help our kids learn is what it means to be human. And, and all of that entails. Martin likes to say, if you, if you, um, if you've read Dickens, you've met every kind of personality type there is. Right. <laughs> And, but being an administrator, you're going to get the same experience. Mm -hmm. You, you, instead of, instead of reading it through books and finding out what it, what, what humanity is really like through books, you're going to get that through interactions day after day after Mm -hmm. day. And you just, you have to go into it kind of expecting that. Uh, Otherwise it's going to become kind of a rude awakening that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not just what we're teaching in the classroom, but it's all of those things, interactions outside the classrooms, the um, encouraging the parents, encouraging the students, encouraging the teachers, all that kind of stuff. It's day in, day out. And so just, um, I, I'm not trying to say that it's all, it's all thorns and, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. whatever. There are some rose petals in there, mm-hmm. right? But it's like a good rose, right? You've got some thorns, you got some petals, you got some beautiful things, you got some hard mm-hmm. things. But just go in expecting that there are going to be some hard things, mm-hmm. um, and and take those breaks too. Mm-hmm. You need those breaks. The school year has breaks, and the administrators also need that time. Mm-hmm. Well, and also I was reminded over the summer conference to walk in gratitude for the opportunity to step in when those measures of correction to culture are needed. Mm-hmm. I think that's really something that we can grow weary doing, but I think it is so true. It's just like discipling our own children or nieces and nephews or, you know, that it is, it's a privilege to step into their mess Mm -hmm. with them. I'm very careful in those corrective conversations to make sure children understand. I, I know that your heart was probably not to hurt them. And I don't say this insincerely most often. It is, it is something I can say. Um, But if there is a positive to highlight in those mm-hmm. moments of correction. Again, void of shame, just making sure a child understands the opportunity to be redirected to a path of goodness. I think that's really key. Yeah. Martin, any advice to someone setting out how they could develop a healthy culture at their school? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, on my Facebook page, which I'm rarely on. I don't know how to operate the, the thing. I, you know, but, but um, 
but I was trying to fiddle around with the the main image. I didn't like the image that I had put there years ago and I, I'm getting more hits now. So I, I decided to change it. I accidentally put up this picture of me leaning against a, 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 a blackboard wall <laughs> uh, back um, in the 1990s in the class <laughs> I was teaching. And the page was inundated with my former students who saw this. And it's like, I, those are the, among the most favorite days of my life. Mm -hmm. I just remember this so fondly and those classes that we had. And <clears throat> it just, you were talking about community earlier on that this, this importance of uh, that, this, this, that when you're teaching, it's not just you're, you're taking something and you're giving it to them. You're doing something together. And when we were reading literature or something, you know, there were times when the discussions were so good that I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, uh, I've read a lot about this book and I've never heard anyone mm -hmm. make this point that Susie just made, mm -hmm. you know, tell them that, tell them, you know, you guys are, are, you guys are thinking thoughts here that maybe nobody's ever thought about this text, but, but it's there. Mm -hmm. You can tell when the person says it, it's, mm -hmm. it's evident enough where it is, it is there. So you, there's, it was almost this atmosphere of co-conspirators in, 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 mm -hmm. in understanding this book. And I think if you, you know, I say it all the time, you know, uh, uh, teaching is ethos, logos, and pathos. It's, it's the, the character of you as a, and, and your expertise as a teacher in what you're teaching. It's, it's, um, it's your uh, presentation of things and, and do, do, is that presenting the material in the best way so that it's most understandable. And pathos, you have to have a passion for it. And if you have that passion, your, your students will see it immediately and they'll, there's something to authenticity that you're not there because you have a job. You know, so many of my teachers in public school, when I was, you know, they're there because they got to be there. They're paid to be there. It's their job. If, if, a, if a child picks up on that, you're in mm -hmm. big trouble. Mm -hmm. um, you really have to have a passion for what you're teaching. And if you do, it will rub off on students and they'll remember it for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't even remember what your question was. But. <laughs> well, and I think you, you brought to mind something that I think is, really important within a church structure or a school structure. Mm -hmm. And that's having children be part of serving, mm -hmm. uh, caring for one another, mm -hmm. you know, within, even when I was teaching second grade years ago, um, how can we, how can you serve your neighbor? Can you go ahead and serve their snack to them? Can we wipe their desk down while they're out of the classroom? Um, having older students, we had some of our seventh graders last year do welcome notes for our kindergartners. Uh, you know, having kids at carpool, we do that on campus all the time. So I think that, level of connectivity you can work that into the dough in many different ways mm -hmm. but it's a really important part of children feeling that they have a place and they have a voice here mm -hmm. yeah ending on service that seems mm -hmm. appropriate mm -hmm. man do you think we've left anything on the plate or or on the table mm -hmm. i mean there's always more to yes. say but so I maybe you'll like just have to be back <laughs> we're usually pretty thorough in our questions because we do a great deal of preparation for the show oh, <laughs> an immense amount <laughs> all right well i've enjoyed this conversation thank you all we'll see you next thank time i'm so prepared we had confetti yeah, right. <laughs> you guys that was so scary i, I agree with you mandy i honestly i, I it did sound I think like a retribution thank you for listening to this episode of classical etc if you enjoyed this conversation please consider liking this video if you want to join the conversation then you can comment below and if you want to stay connected please subscribe to our channel I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.